Okay, wrapping a ponytail holder around this phone onto a tripod. And yeah, we're calling it. <laughs> okay, question, is this working? Have I, have I managed the internet? Have I done the thing? Audio and video. Please say yes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Tamar. I did the thing. This is great news. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm looking in the, the comment section and see so many names of people I care about. Um, hey, so this is Brit. I'm Brit. Hey guys. Um, this is, yep, Sweet Baby Jane. I had a feeling this was just going to take about 30 seconds before she needed to be on my lap or closer. Um, oh, she's coming. Don't you worry. Um, yeah, little, uh, little home setup here. <laughs> it is Jane. Hi, look, my mom's here. I know she's a babe. So my, Jane and my mom both. That's fine. Um, so right now is technically spring break. Um, it is also, uh, a little bit of quarantine time, a little bit of social distancing, everybody's staying safe. So Tamar, who is in the chat right now and has been a wonderful supporter, suggested uh, doing a live stream to kind of gather as a Nature League community, say hi, answer some questions, and just kind of fill our time on this Saturday afternoon or evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, and so yeah, that that is the goal. Oh, good. My, my PJs did make it in. Yeah, that's what I get. That's what I get for that. Um, so, uh, first things first, um, if you don't know, I am in Montana, um, and I go to school at the University of Montana, and so, like I said, I'm on spring break, so I had a little bit of free time anyway. Um, I did ask for some questions, uh, to be posed, um, to answer during this live stream, and of course, we can go back and forth in the chat too, uh, but for now, I figured I'd start with some that were, uh, suggested. So, um, one of them, so Eric, Eric Lervold, who's in the chat right now, who is a wonderful supporter and also collaborator, uh, making some fun science comics that you might have seen on, on uh, Twitter and Instagram. He asked about black and white animals and coloration. Uh, and so it is definitely a thing, right? There are so many black and white animals, or at least black and white stripes, these kinds of features. And one of the ways that we can talk about seeing the same feature like across a bunch of different species is like convergent evolution. It's like, okay, so we just happen to see this, this trait that is, um, you know, everything from a fish to a, a large mammal. So what's going on? Um, I think with science, a lot of times we like to have a simpler answer and maybe not with science, but just human brains. We like to think that it's all for one reason. But I think it's actually more interesting to think on the species level um, individually. So the reason zebras might have stripes could be totally different from the reason that skunks have stripes or something else. So evolutionary biologists have been working on this for quite a while, actually. Um, and if you go back in history, um, I was looking a little bit up uh, things up about this and found that this was one of like the arguments between Darwin and Wallace, the two giants of the field of um, natural selection was the idea of like zebra stripes and just why do they have them and, and why is this a thing? And recent reviews, at least for mammals, talk about uh, this black and white coloration or coloration in general for three kind of broad reasons. You can think about concealment, so camouflage or being hidden. You can think about communication so the ability to have some form of uh, communication, usually between sexes. So the idea of um, maybe a more red coloration to note that um, an individual is able to reproduce, something like that. Uh, and also um, for the regulation of different body processes. So like having a lighter or darker colored nose or, or paws, um, in the case of some mammals, might help with heat regulation. So that's just like coloration as starters. But if you really want to look at black and white, um, uh, no, Tamar, you weren't, you totally were not off because Tamar, you mentioned, um, 
uh, you mentioned uh, the counterpoint or counter shading, right? Um, so you're not wrong at all. Sometimes the black and white coloration we see is in the form of counter shading, where maybe the top side, so if I were, mind you, I'm now a, an orca. So here, dorsal side, which for humans would be posterior, um, that dorsal side could be darker, and then the ventral side or anterior in humans could be a lighter color. Um, and so think about something like an orca. If something is below, looking up, they see what looks like ice, which would make sense for their habitat. And if they were lower and something was looking down, it would just look dark uh, for the bottom. Um, I prefer thinking about great whites for this example uh, for you know similar reasons, but that's definitely a thing. That is absolutely one of the reasons why you get that kind of coloration. Thank God, Eric, <laughs> that I'm going to now be drawn as an orca. I feel like everything's gonna be fine. This is exactly what we needed, <laughs> me as an orca. <laughs> My whole life has led to this moment. Um, so yeah, I, so that's, that's kind of like that counter shading. What's also interesting though, like I was saying, the reason a skunk might be colored in this way could be totally different from a zebra and totally different from a great white. Um, with stripes, I was looking it up and stripes sometimes can actually signify having, um, you know, some kind of potency or like, do not eat me. Um, I think there's like close to seven or so um, species of mustelids. So that's the group that are like weasels that have um, striping and they're the ones that can actually produce from glands those like really noxious um, kind of scents and sprays. So potentially in the case of those small mammals, that black and white coloration or striping is actually saying, hey, I've got the goods. And by the goods, I mean the really stinky, awful stuff. So maybe stay away. Um, yeah, manatee man, um, stripes mimic bright coloring in poisonous animals. So mimicry in general or stripes looking like something else is, is totally a thing, right? Because sometimes stripes might be in a venomous or poisonous animal and then a different species will mimic it to appear that way as well. Um, that's totally a thing. And in fact, um, my friend Tim Ballard asked me about mimicry, which I'll totally um, tap into later. Um, the, the one other thing I was going to say with the black and white, um, just looking at zebras in general, um, there was a group that, and I, I have my little notes right here for some fun, just went through the literature to check it out. Um, there's a 2014 paper that actually did, um, like simulations of zebra stripes and motion to see what happens. Um, oh, Manatee Man, are you, is that Tim? This Ray versus Monarch? Or maybe it's not. That's okay. Yes, Viscerae versus Monarch indeed. Um, the, this paper did simulations to see how stripes with mo motion affect um, visual acuity. And it looks like, uh, at least with zebras and stripes, that stripes like in motion, like I'm doing right now, can display a lot of incorrect information for um, a lot of different species' eyes and eyesight. So uh, that can be anything from like, mammalian predators, so lions uh, in the savannah, um, but also could have to do with um, biting insects. So insects that will try to feed on or, you know, bother um, zebras, it can do the same thing for them. So long story short, if you want to know about the striped coloration or like black and white coloration of certain species, you should really look at the species itself, because the reason it has it could be totally different than the reason something else has it, which is really, really cool. And also um, kind of reminds us that it's never really a one size fits all uh, when it comes to life on earth, which is why it's so awesome to study, <laughs> certainly. Um, so the other, oh yeah, I wrote, I wrote a thing to myself, just interested in this idea of, of black and white. So, you know, patterns and different colorations can certainly be used for things, but why black and white? And I was thinking that maybe, this is just me thinking, I, I, I haven't found this in the literature, but possibly um, there might be like less genes or less, um, I don't know, like energy or cellular activity directed towards something like black and white coloration, because white coloration is simply, um, at least for like mammals, and I'm thinking, you know, like cats, cat fur, white coloration is simply the, the colored gene just not expressing, like there's just not something happening there. So, you know, maybe there's uh, something easier for having 
white striping than some other pattern. Um, different animals having different color receptors. Ooh, that's an awesome, awesome point. Yeah, so so keep in mind, so many um, different species uh, see things in, well, how about this? Every species sees something differently than, than we do, even human to human. Me and my roommates, we all are going to see things differently uh, because of eyesight. Um, one of those big differences across species is color, so being able to recognize. And so, um, PD uh, mentioning in the chat, I think that's I think that's brilliant and probably um, a decent kind of thought here as far as how can I communicate to as many species as possible. Potentially, black versus white is the most um, visible, you know, because of contrast, which makes sense and also potentially uh, works across more species than say doing something like, you know, green and blue or yellow or who knows. Um, so yeah, fun, fun, good stuff. Um, lollipop the skunk, totally, obviously. Um, so the other, uh, I'm just going down these lists of questions that I had and, and you know, jump in on the chat if there's something most in or interesting to you. Um, let's see, Tamara's asking, is there a dominant coloration that is the most widespread on earth? I have no idea, especially because when we think about widespread on earth, like, I mean, 95% of life on earth are like invertebrates, right? <laughs> and I don't know as far as coloration, like you have to get so close up to see some of that. Um, so I have no idea. You'd probably have to break that down to like mammals or fish or birds. Um, and again, that would have to do with different color receptors, right? Cause like birds um, are, uh, tetrachrome, so like four color um, for their eyes, their cones. Humans are have three. Um, and so birds have this extra one that actually allows them to see parts of the UV spectrum. So when they're flying through a forest, all those greens that just look like a, you know, there's green everywhere. How are they not running into all the branches and leaves? They're able to, dis to discern uh, way closer on that kind of a thing. So like PD was mentioning with different species, different color receptors, um, I think you'd probably have to break it into kind of smaller taxonomic groups to really talk about the most dominant form. Though, hey, I have no idea, um, you know, which is kind of interesting. Um, let's see, uh, we have someone asking, like bird and humans, do other animals also find colors aesthetically pleasing? Huh. Um, so aesthetically pleasing, so aesthetic meaning just kind of like the outer appearance. Um, I think that it's really hard to understand if any non-human species is is finding something like pleasing. I mean, there have been brain scans, like functional MRI studies of some non-human species to see if their brains are releasing the kind of chemicals that humans associate with something being pleasing. Um, but whether that is because of an aesthetic, like a look versus um, something else, I feel like it would be so hard. Um, it's hard to even talk to other humans about what they find aesthetically pleasing. So I have no idea and cannot speak for those other species, but I have a feeling that there are certainly reactions that all kinds of species have to certain aesthetics. Um, that's just my, my best. Uh, oh, they just paint themselves with titanium dioxide. Yeah, no, I like that. I think we have an answer. We've got an answer. <laughs> And yes, corvids are, okay, let's be fair. Corvids are absolutely art critics. If any species is an art critic, it would be one of the corvids. Corvids were thinking like crows and ravens. That's why they dress in all black. Maybe they're just a bunch of like theater professors that are like, mm, no, I'm a no. I'm a no for all of this. Is that what, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. I think, yeah, manatee man is onto something. I do, I do believe. <laughs> Speaking of blue, is it true that some insects hate blue? Um, well, again, the idea of like, the idea of hate, you know, kind of hard to discern with individuals we can't really speak to, but um, avoidance behavior, you know, we can at least note when something is avoiding something else. Um, I don't know about the insect thing you're speaking of. Um, there are so many insects on earth though, so I would, I would find it hard to believe that it'd be like a shared across the board thing. Um, but I am not sure. That's a great question. They don't hate, they just despise. That's fair. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the idea of something being aesthetically pleasing could totally be linked to something that's evolutionarily beneficial. Yeah. 
absolutely. Um, but yeah, uh, Melody, I, I'm not sure. There are just way too many insects and I, and I, and I maybe in certain regions and certain ecosystems, there would be avoidance because maybe there's a predator that is colored that way. Um, but on the whole, I don't know. Um, but it's an awesome question. Um, so Tamar asked uh, uh, yesterday um, on Twitter, one of my uh, three favorite shark species. And Tamar, you know that's just not fair to ask a mother to choose between her children. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, I, God, I just, I just love sharks and there's so many sharks and you guys, just like a couple days ago, there's a new publication where they found two brand new species of six gilled sharks, which is awesome. Most sharks have five gills. Uh, six gilled sharks are more rare and it's more of an adaptation. Some of them are found deeper. Um, and they are also like sawtooth. They, they look so, so cool. Um, so, I mean, sharks have been around for like 450 million years and we're still finding uh, new species that we just, we had no idea about. Um, so for me to pick three favorites, it's like, I don't even know all of my options yet, <laughs> but I will, um, I will tell you a couple that I, that I do definitely love. Um, I am such a sucker uh, as far as just like the most basic, the most basic uh, shark love. Um, I love great white sharks. I just do. I always have. Um, my parents are on the chat. They can certainly confirm. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's just a grandeur, um, you know, to them. Um, and there is a charisma. There's, yep, yeah, yeah, my mom says, uh, yep. I think so much of that also has to do with imprinting from, you know, younger childhood books and things. Like so many of the species I, I love still are things that I was exposed to because my parents had, you know, um, nature documentaries or, or books on different species for me that I still have. And the great white is just so, so picturesque and so um, just kind of like almost uses like a flagship for sharks uh, that I just love it still to this day. I just love it. Um, and so that, that would be one of them. Um, I also really love thresher sharks. Thresher sharks have <laughs> good parenting. They really did, Tamar. They, re they really are the best. Um, thresher sharks have these really long uh, top of their caudal tail, so that the, very, the tail on the very, very end. Um, so if you imagine like the body of a shark. Oh, hey, look, I have a shark prop. Great. <laughs> so this hammerhead here. Um, which was a, a lovely Christmas gift um, from people I love very much. Um, this is a hammerhead, but imagine on a thresher shark, this piece would actually be going out like as long as this full body could go. And so th those are thresher sharks. And they also have like kind of tinier faces with these bigger eyes. Hey, baby Jane. Um, and and I don't know, they're just, they're just so neat. And I love that um, as kind of an adaptation. Uh, I see, I love those unique kind of um, little little features, right? I mean, there are so many sharks that are known for so many things, like you think speed, and you know, mako sharks, and um, you know, depth is something else, or like, you know, size, like whale sharks and basking sharks, but I don't know, thresher sharks have just always been very cool. Um, Talus whale sharks are very, very cool. Uh, they are the biggest fish on earth, which is pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> wait, tuna. Oh, tuna. Um, yeah, no favorite specific shark. Um, probably the one in the comic life of sharks that wants to punch Lorraine. If she keeps singing baby shark, I don't know his name or her name, but, um, it's a hero. That shark is a hero. <laughs> uh, oh, good. I, um, Claudia, that's um, really lovely to hear. Thanks. I look, guys. Like, um, here's the thing: being alive and being a species and existing as life on Earth comes with challenges. So our species right now has a challenge. I think learning about other species and their adaptations um, definitely makes me less anxious because I kind of like to look at it on like a larger perspective. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that, Claudia. That's very cool. Um, and uh, let's see, Tamar's asking me about uh, Helicaprion. Let me, let me pull that up because that is definitely one of my current tabs because I was 
looking at, yeah, new species of saw shark found in West Indian Ocean. Let's see, not one, but two new species. Yep, da da da. Um, cages and Anna's six gill saw sharks. Um, I am not sure, Tamar. Let me let me check. I actually have the uh, here. I'll put the I'll put the um the abstract to the article in. Hey, baby Jane. There you go. Um, that that's about the new species of uh, six gill sharks. Um, and so yeah, Tamar asked me about three. So great white thresher, and then um, I love the frilled shark. Hi, baby girl. Um, they look like a lot of people have told me um, Hellspawn, uh, horror from the deep, um, <laughs> aliens, um, and yeah. So they kind of remind me of goblin sharks a little bit, just in terms of like looking absolutely out of this world. Um, frilled sharks. They have, imagine like kind of their gills, that tissue that is getting oxygen from, from the water. Uh, they're kind of like frilled out, hence its name. They're really deep living. Um, and when I worked uh, at the University of Florida during my undergrad um, within the ichthyology, like fish collection, uh, we had one that I would always go and look at, um, like in a jar, you know. Um, Baby Jane Power Hour is not a joke. I don't know if the camera can see her right now, but I think, okay, hang on. My cameraman is going to do an assist and make that this is seen. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. The babe. Just the babe. Okay, good. Um, Melody, same. Absolutely same. Um, completely agree. So yeah, I, I do, I definitely do have a soft spot for, for the health spot. <laughs> Things that I just find so wonderful that people typically recoil at. Um, so yeah, indeed. Um, Baby Jane, let's look at this next question that I wrote down from people. Um, well, we were talking about mimicry. I can go ahead and look at, so yeah, my friend, um, Tim Ballard, uh, who I do theater with um, here in Montana, uh, was asking about uh, mimicry and just um, how completely, you know, incredible it is to see something like a stick insect. Like, how on earth do you get that detailed of, of mimicry? Um, that kind of mimicry is called like homomorphy um, or homomorphy. I'm sure there's so many ways to say it, but homo meaning same and then morphy meaning like shape. Um, so that's when something mimics the exact like shape of something else um like in the environment so something like a leaf an insect being like a leaf or a stick insect looking like a stick um first of all the thing to note about those kinds of adaptations is that we're talking you know tens of thousands if not millions of years of, of evolution um to get things that specific now in some cases we've seen you know um evolution happen in way shorter time periods. But when we're talking about that homomorphy or like truly like completely mimicking that same shape, um, that kind of stuff takes a lot of time. Um, so baby Jane, look, here's the thing. I'm talking to the people about things that you just don't give a shit about and that's okay. That's okay because I love you very much. All right, that was the baby Jane sidebar, sorry. Um, Although you will like this one, because I'm sure you would hunt a stick insect. So um, in following up with Tim's question, because he mentioned stick insects, I was actually kind of curious um, and checked it out. And I found uh, a 2016 paper that this is really cool. Uh, they were looking at um, kind of the history of plant mimicry. So the history of different species mimicking plants. So like sticks and leaves and things like this bark even um and they found an example i think it was of a of a katie did uh from back in it looks like um yeah back to the permian so we're talking like before dinosaurs uh this is going back like 300 mil 250 million years ago uh and they found an example of it um so i mean this is like something that life on earth has been doing for a very very long time uh, and again, meaning that it takes quite a while to happen. Um, the specifics of, you know, like how does each piece of the body change over time? 
um, is not something we know super specifically for a lot of these species because they live, you know, long enough to where we can't track enough generations within our human and scientific timeline to, to really know. Um, there has been genetic work to see kind of exactly where these changes are happening. So are they just external? Are there things occurring? Um, is it gene expression or is it um, actual like uh, uh, the body plan, which are usually uh, incorporated in something called homeobox genes? Um, you know, is there an environmental cue? Uh, is it one of those where there was simply, you know, a mutation a long, long time ago that wound up being beneficial and that one hung around and then that happened a bunch of times? Honestly, like you have to look at it species by species, but um a lot of it, it looks like, yeah, so in this 2016 paper that looked at plant mimicry, um, you know, they're talking about the most striking cases you see are stick insects, prey mantises, butterflies, katydids. Uh, and a lot of these are specific modifications to the body and the wings. And looks like it is in response to predation, at least in the case of these guys. Um, nice one, Zachary. I agree. <laughs> um Tim also asked me if nature got in a fight with nurture, who would win and why, um, which is awesome. And I know my mom will love this answer. Um, my mom uh, studied and teaches about developmental psychology, and we talk about this a lot. Um, it's not nature versus nurture. It's totally nature via nurture because we are learning so much about the way that uh, our environment can actually affect uh our genes what we would call typically you know nature um, is what you're born with or how you were raised well um, it's totally both and they work completely together in ways that we are like just scratching the surface on um there you go mom yep <laughs> exactly <laughs> we're gonna make t-shirts nature via nurture yeah it's true um it's uh you just you simply just can't you can't separate it and the more that we're learning about epigenetics which are ways um that are uh, non-genetic changes to an organism's uh, full set of DNA. So they're actually environmental changes that then occur. It's not something that's passed on, except it potentially is, like we're still learning about it, um, you know, is, is kind of a, an amazing thing. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly, Manatee Man, yeah, via nurture. Yeah, environment influencing phenotype. So phenotype um, that they're mentioning, phenotype is what we see on the outside. Uh, but the environment can also influence what we see on the inside, so the expression of certain genes and things we're learning about um, early life trauma um, or even trauma to adults that then it affects their um, sperm or egg cells in humans. Uh, we've seen it in mice. Um, it's totally a thing and really kind of amazing. Um, some sick t-shirts. Uh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you guys are way too good. You're too good at this. Um, let's see, another question we got. Uh, what should or can we do as scientists to get people into wildlife, nature, and natural history? Um, from Dr. Stamatis Zogaris on Twitter. Um, this is kind of an interesting question because it goes, it gets a little philosophical, at least for me and the way I think of it. It goes to the idea of uh, maybe what a scientist is or what a scientist should be. And should a scientist really be um, pushing the public to get into something or be interested in something, or should a scientist be presenting the facts for analysis and then others take up those facts and use them to do something like outreach? Um, within uh, the field of wildlife biology, scientists and then managers, like the people making the, the decisions, um, wildlife biologists are often at the, at the interface of those two fields. Uh, they are both providing um, research, just gathering data, but then are a lot of times asked to make a recommendation to managers for what they should do. And whenever we run into the word should, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, I know for me, that was one of the reasons I struggled so much with doing just wildlife biology instead of larger policy work was because it would it stressed me out so much, the idea of making a suggestion or the idea of just presenting the data like it's such an awkward gray area um so i will say that as far as you know what should scientists do to get people into this topic um this is just my opinion 
Uh, I think scientists should keep presenting the facts in the best way that they can uh, so that people can see and experience and get shown pieces of the world that then those people can fall in love with on their own. Um, and also, you know, everyone doesn't have to be into the same thing. I mean, if we are sitting there, you know, proselytizing, saying you guys should all be into this, um, I don't know that that's very healthy. Whereas I like to just say, here's this amazing thing and I would love to tell you about it, right? And I like the facts to kind of lead the way as far as that is concerned. Um, you know, uh, so Melody is, oh, Elizabeth Wilk, hi Liz. Oh my gosh, how wonderful. There are just so many people I, I care about in here um, and I'm so happy to see you all. Yeah, so are scientists better at outreach and science communication? Well, here's the thing. Um, so he, uh, this, is, this is wild. So scientists in general, like if you looked across the board, um, you would see certain personality traits, a little bit more introversion. Um, so like sometimes less sociality, um, you know, a little bit, <laughs> they're better at social distancing, if you will. <laughs> um, and of course that's not all of them, right? They, there's never an all. Um, yeah, here's this amazing thing is my personal favorite. Yeah, I agree, Melody. Um, so, you know, there are certain personality types that might draw someone into wanting to do laboratory research that does not lend itself to wanting to do a public presentation or a live stream, right? I'm kind of a strange breed because I enjoy like genetics and being doing stuff in the lab, right? And I've done that years ago, um, but I also love doing musical theater <laughs> and I like speaking. And I don't ever want to say that scientists like should or have to be science communicators because I don't think that every scientist has that skill set. Um, nor do I think that every science communicator has the proper science skill set, right? Like that collaborative um, piece is so important. So for example, like um, on SciShow, um, if you guys watch SciShow, uh, you know, we have science communicators who write these scripts, but um, then we have independent fact checkers. So I'm hired as a fact checker. And so I can go in and receive a script about um, marine snow that someone has already worked really hard on. And then I can go and collaborate and pick tiny pieces and just make sure that everything looks good. So a double checking, right? And then from there, the storytelling uh, happens through graphics, right? If Tuna's still here, um, we tell it visually, we tell it with a host, right? It'll be Hank on the screen, or if it's SciShow Psych, it'd be me on the screen. Um, so there's all these different pieces um, of science communication, and I don't think that everyone has to be all of them. I think it's totally okay for a scientist to simply do their work, do it well, and the only thing they really advocate for is good quality data and then people can take it up from there. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a rare kind of intersect, but I think if a scientist is able to do it well, awesome, please do it. But if not, like it's okay. Um, yeah, uh, Zachary, that's a really, really awesome point. Um, and, and I'll be honest, like I, I struggle with this, the idea of doctoral level research and you know what that does really is is driving you down to one topic so intensely um and when we start looking at a single topic uh, from a single perspective uh in a very deep way um deep understanding is wonderful but it really does um kind of put a lens and a bias into then the way that we see the rest of the world um and so i um my PhD right now is moving into a more interdisciplinary area, literally, like I'm working with an interdisciplinary PhD um, program at the University of Montana because I think it is so important um, to not zoom in too far, but rather to understand uh, the things that you find, but from different perspectives. So I personally think that wildlife biology should include environmental philosophy and, you know, um, it should also include mathematics. Like, really good um, data science, right? Good statistics and all this. Um, let me see. Uh, Joel, what's the basic level of science that you would like to see in the general population? Ah, uh, yes, science literacy. Well, let me just go ahead and do a, um, a definite holla and like appreciation high five and tens to those in the chat right now who are educators. 
Um, my mom is one of my favorite educators. Petey is also in here. She's one of my good friends here. She's a fourth grade teacher. Um, and some of you guys are educators potentially as well. Um, here's the thing. Um, when we are growing up and what we are exposed to is so, so formative for how then we are able to see the world and become, you know, literate in a certain topic. Um, I've done, uh, I tutor on the side, not right now, <laughs> but in general for the last, you know, five, six years, tutoring has been a huge part of my life. Um, and it's been really amazing to me, uh, working with college students, um, girls actually in, in math who have said that they, for whatever reason, um, you know, had one teacher maybe that said the wrong comment or an adult said the wrong comment about girls in math and they were already struggling and they kind of formed this idea that they couldn't be good at math, which just A is, is bullshit, but B is really saying something about that power of those comments, right? Just those side comments about like, oh, well, you know, you probably really can't do that or that's a fair point hat. Maybe you should be on good. That's a very fair point. Um, you know, th there's, there's so many things that are said, uh, at so many different age groups that can then inform. So with science literacy, I think that to say like a quote baseline, um, you know, basic level feels unfair because there's so many different ability levels. And I, I would love to see everyone kind of explore to the extent of their ability, but I will say that, um, elementary education, middle school, um, and of course, just the whole way up, uh, presenting science in a way that is not um, scary. It's not, um, you know, arrogant. It's, it doesn't feel like, you know, lab coats at an, an academic, you know, ivory tower kind of a thing. Um, that is so, so important. And um, uh, Petey, who's in the, the live stream, you know, I've gone into her fourth grade classroom and we've worked together um, doing science and, and in her fourth grade classroom, um, there's actually a tie in between science and literature. So the kinds of books they read and the terms they learn can also have, um, science literacy, uh, within it. There's one about porpoises and peril. Um, you know, so I came in and we talked about what is a porpoise and then also, um, like noise pollution and these things. But the point is science can be integrated in like every topic, um, every single topic. And, it's those educators that are doing that on a daily basis that I think um, is what's so, 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 so important. So while that's not like a perfect specific or short answer, I just wanna say that I am amazed by science educators um, and just educators in general and um, I'm just so happy to know so many of them and know the hard work that they do. Um, yeah, I mean, basic level critical thinking and research skills. Um, I mean, I can even say, honestly, um, Melody, um, you right, you right. That lab coat looked good. <laughs> I like how I did this as if this is a lab coat. It's just, I made a choice. I made a bold choice. Um, Zachary, I think uh, critical thinking and research skills. Look, I, I will say this. I would love, love, love to see as students exit um, elementary. So we'll say um, for those, you know, not in the United States, uh, let's say ages, you know, 12, 11, 12, uh, that those leaving elementary school have the ability to ingest knowledge after checking to see veracity or truth. So understanding um, credible sources and also being able to pick apart uh, whether they want something to be true or if they are just ingesting like, oh, here here are the things, here, here are the facts, here are the data. That's really hard for adults to do, right? But just like the idea of kids exiting elementary and being able to, when they see a fact presented online on Facebook by a friend, they're able to pause, think about whether that might be true, find where that fact came from or what the source is, and then think about it. And that's, I think, within critical thinking. Yeah, skepticism, totally. Um, totally, totally. So I think that that's a really good, uh, kind of baseline and also like to challenge their own assumptions, right? There's, I think so many times the idea of, um, science, uh, because it is humans, right. And we're totally imperfect and we care and we're passionate. The idea of getting a hypothesis, you know, right. Or the idea of science, um, you know, proving something, uh, is just so not what it's about. Um, science is, I, speaking with an environmental um, 
philosophy professor, we kind of went back and forth on this, but I like to think science is exploration, not explanation. So science should be the exploration of, of space, of information, of knowledge, of a field, um, not trying to explain something, but rather to glean information about something. Because at the end of the day, science, the scientific process is, is literally about ruling things out. You chuck out things that you can falsify, right? That's out, that's out, that's out, that's out. And as you do that, you get closer and closer to what might be the truth, um, but you're never actually proving something. And so with elementary school, like with younger kiddos, you know, the idea of my hypothesis was wrong. Oh no, I did it wrong. Is just like, no, 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 there, there is, there is no wrong. That's, that's amazing that your, your, your guess was wrong. That means you learned something. Maybe you discovered something awesome. Um, there's a way that we, we need to talk about that with younger kids and that, you know, science educators are doing all the time about just the idea of we are exploring possibilities, you know? Um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, that's kind of what I like to think at least. Uh, and I try to point that out anytime I work with a younger student and we talk about um, science and just the idea of exploration, um, you know, which is cool. Um, Crash Course Navigating Digital Information. Oh, awesome. I have not seen that. That's very cool. Uh, excellent. Yeah. Huh. That was odd. Right. Because there's so much we don't know and so many of the coolest things we discover have been discoveries like actually just like what the hell is that instead of oh this looks like kind of what i was thinking was going on it's just like dude as soon as you go in thinking i'm looking for this thing you've missed that 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 right the entire other you know pieces of this probability space so yeah um philosophy of science is something i could i could go on for for quite a bit about um this is bothering my head but that's okay here wait maybe the shark thoughts you look good big jane we have a very cozy room right now there are three cozies in here one human one dog one cat and then me i feel like i'm doing it wrong but i am in these cozies so it's okay um oh nice laura yeah oh <laughs> tuna you better believe it um dale is definitely here for any of who know Project for Awesome. Um, I was gonna put him here, but that's Sweet Baby Jane's sunspot, although she's currently on the couch that way because I think she's not pleased about there not being sun right now because I closed this. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, um, Laura, that's a really that's a really cool point. All right, Dale's gonna go here. Jane, just get over it. It's gonna be fine. There we go. Perfect. Um yeah, like, oh no, why, why would I want to be rejecting something? What, like, that doesn't seem right, but it, but it is. Because if you imagine very broadly, if there is truth here and science is, again, ruling things out, rejecting along the way, getting closer and closer, um, you know, that's one thing that science tries to do. It's never actually proving, uh, proving something. Uh, which, you know, is definitely a, a hit to ego <laughs> if your your job is to get things wrong. Um, but it's true. And so, like, we can be excited about that so that we do it a little bit better without that kind of bias um, or worry or concern about, you know, being wrong. Um, instead, it's cool to find out why was this wrong? What else is possibly happening? You know, that kind of a thing. Um, hello there, Bugsy's Evil Deeds. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, those were some of the questions that I had from like online. Um, I am totally open to, to questions now in the chat as we, as we hang for a little bit. And also, um, if you're just joining, um, thank you for joining. We're just talking about life on earth. And as we, our species deals with one of those challenges of being alive, um, we're just talking about other species. And, uh, right now we're talking about the philosophy of science, which is very fun. Um, Tomorrow, that's definitely Dale. He's got he's got the Shrek ears on. Um, okay, so here we go. Do you think we've reached in point in philosophy of science, or there's no more? Oh, oh my gosh, we are we are not an end point. I mean, that's the thing about philosophy. Similarly to science, I mean, it is an exploration, right? There's there's not an end point. Um, my philosophy of ecology professor um, Swazi Lebian. She's actually I did a Nature League episode with her. One of the first ones I ever did. Um, it was me and her and, uh, and Caitlin Hoffmeister, and we were talking about philosophy within uh, nature. Um, 
and there's just there's so much to learn she started as a as a quantum physicist she's also just a total badass which is great um she started as a quantum physicist was asking bigger questions that led her to go into philosophy of science and then more recently while at the university of montana she's gone into philosophy of ecology um and that's a course that i took with her and um that's a wonderful yeah melody that's a wonderful point um you know there's actually two different kinds main kinds of philosophy i guess analytical philosophy and continental philosophy but within analytical philosophy which is what she does and this kind of stuff that i'm really interested in um this is more uh breaking down these questions of you know like what is an ecosystem literally what is it um what is nature actually what is nature you know these questions in the anthropocene um as we start creating a synthetic synthetic biology synthetic cells uh what is life right so technology is progressing humans are progressing so the kinds of questions we ask are also progressing um for sure um the end of science by oh cool thanks man he man excellent um yeah so i mean that's just from the analytical perspective and then if you want to add in the ethics and moral philosophy like there are so many so many questions for the anthropocene so yeah no we're, we're certainly not um anywhere close to an end point uh as our our whole world changes so do our questions and our exploration of those things um totally quarantine fireside chats <laughs> totally <laughs> totally um yeah, what else? Baby Jane, what you thinking? I will have to check that out, man, if you man. End of science. Let's see. Oh, favorite dinosaur. Yep. Fair enough, Eric. Um, I am a sucker for a velociraptor, or at least like the any tips for someone starting. Yeah. Um, all about velociraptor. Um Jurassic, the Jurassic Park version <laughs> of the, of, of the others. Um, so larger, you know, Megaraptor or something else. Um, wait, my, my companion human animal is asking me to scroll the, scroll the, um, scroll the, what do you see? He's looking, he's looking, which way? Scroll up or down? This way? Okay. Got it. Got it. Yep. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> we have this going from uh, HDMI from my laptop over. <laughs> He's pointing out a question that was in the... Where? Down? Okay. Wait, are you there? Are you there? Anything? Nope. He's throwing his hands out. Up. That's okay. Um, I'll go to... I'll go to the any any tips um uh any tips for someone starting uni biology soon um yeah that's a that's a really a really great question um so is that like undergrad or is that graduate level uh because i think that approaching those two differently is is kind of a good idea um <laughs> um so as far as going undergraduate, um, undergraduate is interesting because it, you can really make it as broad as you want, or you can, um, zero in. So like I knew ex kind of exactly what I wanted to study. And so I just like went turbo into the exact things I wanted to know about. Um, which honestly kind of did me a disservice because I never took, um, any literature. I never took any philosophy, which I would find out I am totally in love with. Um, I didn't take any, um, history. I took, I didn't take any languages. Um, you know, it's like, I was just so zeroed in that I, that I missed quite a bit that I've only now got around to during my PhD, which is strange, but I guess I'm working in reverse, you know? Um, so I would say for, for university and for biology, first of all, a lot of times, um, biology or like general, general bio, um, a lot of those classes can be weed out courses because of pre-med students. Um, and so I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Or yeah, I'm not sure if you're going to a place with a big, um, like med school or a highly competitive field like that. But like my undergrad has a very competitive medical school 
um, in hospital. And so doing biology and zoology there was really being packed into classrooms, um, lecture halls, uh, you know, everyone trying to beat each other out, um, which was not a very good learning environment, you know. Uh, so I would say first, that is something to keep in mind. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind with with college in general, and this, I think, more and more as I do more and more college, um, I think that college should be used and a degree should be used kind of um, in two ways. One, for that general growth and getting to learn amazing things from amazing people. Um, but two, definitely uh, like a means to an end in terms of what do you want to be doing and does a degree stand in your way of doing it? Because if not, then hey, maybe don't go to graduate school, do this job instead. Um, you know, if if you do not need a bachelor's of biology to do that thing, then then don't get one. Do something else instead. Um, think about the actual day to day life, and then ask yourself, what gets me there? Um, and I know that, like, that's a very broad kind of a thing, but um, I think it really matters because a lot of times we do degrees just because we think we should or we need to. Um, but thinking about that end goal of like, what's the dream job? What, how do I want to contribute to this world? And is a degree going to stop me for that or, or get in my way? I think is really important. Um, learn how to learn. Yeah, Miriam, absolutely. Um, my parents can attest that my parents, uh, had a very different high school experience than I did. And they talked about within, um, community college and then undergraduate before they went on and did their graduate degrees, just, they had to learn how to learn again. Um, thinking, thinking critically and deeply, yeah, things you might not get in K-12 school. Um, incoming message. Is this an incoming message? Oh, I see. My companion animal has thrown me a message saying, Tamar asked how you are doing. <laughs> that seems fair. Um, yeah, exactly, Bugsies. Right. Math and drafting and I are photographer. Right. Which is totally fine. Um, yeah, how am I doing? I am, I am doing okay. Right now it's a little crazy and um, some things I care about very much, you know, have been canceled. Um, I was in a, a musical and had a role that I really cared about and was a big awesome one. And, you know, our second weekend got, got canceled and that's really hard when you've worked on something and then it can't happen. Um, but we're thankful for the shows that we did get to do on that first weekend. Um, there's a lot of art that I now can't do a lot of storytelling, but I don't think it's a can't. I think it's, this is evolution, right? Like this is, um, life on earth has to, um, move, adapt or die. And so performing arts and the kinds of things we used to do or had scheduled, we have to adapt or have to move. And I think it's going to move online. So, you know, I might be doing virtual cabarets. Um, you know, that's, that's hard. And that's also, you know, money lost and, uh, you know, things financially are hard, but the beautiful thing I'm so thankful for is working with Complexly and having Nature League and doing SciShow, um, and being able to be a part of this virtual community, right. Being able to do what we're doing right now. I'm like so thankful for, um, and I also live in a house of great people. So, um, as far as like quarantine goes, we're, we're not too bad. I said that I can't imagine how much this would suck if you live with assholes, um, you know, or small children, but <laughs> looking at you, Petey, keep strong, keep strong. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm checking the, uh, art, uh, finds a way Tuna, bless you. Just bless you. Um, yeah, live stream musical online. Yep. Yep. I think I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to definitely record some, uh, some songs and bits and maybe parodies. I thought would be pretty fun. Genetic engineering. Um, with rise of genetic engineering, would pandemics like this be a thing of the past? No. Disease will never be a thing of the past. As long as we're a living like social species. Um, I think the idea of, of disease or a pandemic going away is, is very unlikely. Um, I think treating it more quickly maybe is a thing. Sure. Um, uh, but keep in mind, there is this, this arms race, evolutionary arms race between, um, you know, the things that make us sick and the things that make us better, uh, with humans, a lot of that arms race is technology. So engineering, like you're saying, 
Um, whereas the other species that we're up against, or non-species, right? Viruses are a very weird middle ground of life and non-life. Um, but you know, they're changing as well, and we're changing. Um, antibiotics, uh, antibiotic resistance. I think um, genetic engineering could potentially make us even worse off as far as like our exposure to things and then inability to have our own immune systems respond. Um, you know, I, uh, there's, yeah, uh, uh, parasites uh, find a way. Yeah, that is a fair thing. Um, right, novel diseases will always exist precisely. Um, and again, they will evolve just like everything else, uh, on earth. And, you know, with genetic engineering, keep in mind, like there's only, um, there's only so much like forecasting you could do about what you wanted to engineer. Um, you know, you could engineer certain, um, maybe abilities of white blood cells to combat you know, foreign bodies or pieces of the, of the immune system. But then for all you know, the issue winds up being um, something viral and not bacterial or it's bacterial and not viral. And you just can't um, guess. And, and again, I, I don't know that it's necessarily the way because if we wind up building up so many walls of, of tech, as soon as something's happening on the ground in real life, person to person, um, you know, we might not have exposed ourselves to let our antibodies and personal systems be able to work and evolve over time. But I mean, who knows? Um, if Jeff Goldblum came into the stream, I would actually die. And then they would have to report a COVID-19 death in Montana, but it would be like COVID-19 tangent because she was doing a live stream because of being, you know, holed up in her house because of COVID-19. And then Jeff Goldblum came on and she actually died of happiness. So technically we're make look, you guys, the World Health Organization does not know what to do with that data point. So maybe we should just not. But at the same time, Jeff Goldblum, please join. Please join. <laughs> um, am I into CRISPR? You know, I have more of a... 375 bake for 20 minutes kind of a gal um I don't know honestly I so a lot of my past research and um collaborators that I have now uh do conservation genetics so they use genetic techniques and gather genetic data to um inform management decisions at least you know that's kind of the goal obviously it's harder than that uh in reality um but the idea of, of changing things, um, especially within wild populations or non-human species, um, for me, gets really tricky because if you want to think about conservation, you're like, oh, well, this species is um, potentially uh, susceptible to this disease, so we should, you know, go in and change this. It's like, okay, but keep in mind, um, we are changing things based on human perspective. Like, we can never know the perspective of that other species um, and potentially what it needs to be able to, you know, move, adapt, survive, thrive, and evolve. Um, making the, picking, picking and choosing winners and losers uh, is something that is a little hard for me to deal with. I, I struggle with that ethically, um, which is why conservation is very difficult to me. <laughs> um, and let's see. <laughs> yes, the Beatles. That's a really fair point. Um, let's see, there are seven different domestic animals that are actually obtained wild ones, not domestic, sharks are fish, not domesticable. I don't know. I don't know. I think, yeah, domestic, domesticatable. I, I, I mean, there are some incredible examples of, of domestication. I mean, domestication really is just, you know, changes to genetics over time and then the keeping of, you know, these inside. I feel like a goldfish is like totally domesticated, at least like one sold at, you know, county fairs. Um, so I guess it depends on like how you define domestication. Um, the oven crisper joke. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I have no idea, but that's a great question, Manatee. <laughs> um, yeah, Zachary, so that's, that's one of the big um, kind of things that like I grapple with, you know, with conservation, restoration, preservation, you know, whatever this is, is it like, are we going in and saying, ooh, yeah, we really screwed that up. Let's 
fix this because we did that are bad? Or is it, you know, these things are in trouble for whatever reason and we care about them and our values and priorities are for these species and we want them to keep being alive so we then do things to keep them alive. Um, you know, a little bit, a little bit tricky there, right? PCR guys. <laughs> love that melody. Love that. Um, the Jeff Goldfish is A plus PD. Thank you. Um, a plus. So, so yeah, I mean, conservation, like that's definitely a big question. I mean, think about, um, invasive species. Hi, Max. Welcome. Um, oh my gosh, we've already been going for an hour. How fun. That's okay. I'm feeling good. We can go for a little bit longer. Um, for, uh, oh, what am I, what am I thinking? Um, oh no, what was I just thinking? My dad's fear of gravitational waves can be that. Well, I mean, fair enough. Um, oh, what was I just thinking? Conservation. Oh, 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 I remember. So like the idea of, you know, invasive species, um, that's one of those of like, oh, well, if we introduce them, should we then be responsible for eradication because that's us making up for a human mistake or <laughs> can you look at that and see that as actually just like killing a ton of life on earth Ooh, like that gets really that gets really tricky um you know uh yeah manatee man maybe it's microsatellites um microsat pcr yeah um oh my gosh the genetics nerd jokes happening in the comments right now make my life. Thank you all. Baby Jane, you are not getting second lunch. Okay, she literally has a hobbit feeding schedule. It is not a joke. This is not a joke. Um, mountain out, he's, making, he's making a mountain out of a black hole. Come on now. Um, well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm just open to general yeah general questions general general when did i last see a shark oh good good one tomorrow i mean while while home while visiting florida um at home i usually go to um aquariums and like rehabilitation centers on the gulf coast um that definitely have a quite a few nurse sharks and some others that i see so that's usually on christmas so in the last year um the last diving specifically with sharks um was with my dad and oh man that might have been more than like five years ago or so but it was like one of the best scuba diving trips ever um so that was some really good stuff for sure um i love you too mom and dad bye love you love you um let's see are you currently doing research and how is the social distancing thing affecting that okay yeah great question um so me currently i'm doing a PhD, now it's in interdisciplinary studies. So much of what my research is personally is actually um, online. So online data sets for international policy um, and work. So because I'm not doing actual genetic data right now, at least I'm not collecting it in the lab. I'm simply, I can either analyze it or look at genetic data policies and things. Um, I I am really not that affected. Like this is actually really strange. My day-to-day -day life has not been changed much except for um, a lot of my tutoring and teaching jobs are gone right now. So that's hard. And a lot of my performing work um, is gone and that's really hard. But my actual research and schoolwork is kind of fine. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, um, so so that's a thing. Um, let's see. Do you think it'd be better, uh, Zachary? Do you think it'd be better or worse if we could make invasive species sterile instead of killing them? I don't know, man. I don't know. This is one of those where I like. If I start thinking about it, like keeps me up at night, legit. Um, if you saw, um, I did the. I sat down with Hank and we talked about invasive species on that one episode, and I kind of brought up some of the points and things that I struggle with. Um, I, I just don't know. Um, I want humans to take responsibility for when they make choices that wind up leading to, you know, if they introduce something that kills a lot of things, like I feel like we should be responsible, but if we're going in and eradicating or sterilizing, you know, and stopping life on earth in that way, like how is that necessarily different? I, I don't know. I, I just don't know, but you know what? That's okay. It's okay to not know. And it's okay to be, 
on the fence because it means that you're thinking and feeling about it deeply and I think that that's important. <laughs> um, so Eric, what's the scariest thing you found while scubaing? Um, other humans, man, let me tell you, those guys are terrifying. They've got tanks on, blowing air out unnaturally under the water. That's a, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I love scuba diving so much. Um, uh, not necessarily like scary, but definitely like, oh, I am alert. Uh, was on that one dive, uh, that I was doing with my dad with shipwrecks off of the coast of North Carolina, on um, the Atlantic ocean. Um, and we were doing it specifically for, for the sharks and saw a ton of, um, sand tires, lemon sharks and just hulking, you know, buses, uh, you know, shark types that are very cool. Um, and as we rounded a corner while we were down, um, we saw what we both knew immediately as, as a bull shark, um, bull sharks by nature, um, are pretty aggressive. Uh, in fact, probably the most aggressive shark species. Um, in terms of like uh, unsolicited attacks um, and those stats, they're not that big, so they don't have as many deaths to their name, <laughs> but they're they're pretty damn aggressive. Um, and what was funny is like my dad and I, you know, we're scuba diving. We don't have special telecom systems. We using like scuba sign language, um, scuba sign language. Uh, like this is shark, um, which is kind of funny, like, you know, making a fin. So we were both trying to figure out <laughs> while we were underwater how to say bull shark to the to the other. And we're both doing it at the same time. And like my dad was like doing doing like this, which like I was like, is it a unicorn? Like devil <laughs> and then like I was like trying to like with my foot, like, you know, a bull like is, you know, moving and it was beyond it's stupid. <laughs> we probably look completely insane. Um, so yeah, I would say that was like one of those moments of like, oh, that is, that's a thing that, um, should probably get some space. Um, yeah, I once fished a barracuda. Yeah. Barracudas are no joke. Um, let's see. Does our, uh, does our responsibility for the problem absolve our responsibility for the solution? Um, that is so elegantly stated and I, I just don't know, especially when it comes to like as an individual, you know, like if I have to, um, my companion animal is reading here, come here, Vanna, you can show your arm. <laughs> my companion animal has just thrown me this in response to Tamar's question. Um, yeah, it exactly Bugsy. Like it's, yeah, it's, where do we even draw the line? Um, yeah, it was a little hard. Uh, QWERTY, um, again, that that is the question and I, I wish I had an answer, but I just struggle with it. Um, Tamar, here's uh, again from my, my wonderful parents, a Megalodon tooth uh, fossil that was a Christmas gift one, um, one year. Uh, it is super sweet. It's so cool is very, very rad. Yeah, the serrations are just so awesome. So yeah, Megalodon, so ancestor, great white. Um, yeah, this guy definitely hangs in the house. Um, there are like more stuffed sharks in <laughs> my room than I care to admit, though I will happily admit, so many. Um, so yeah, that's a good one for sure. Um, thank you, companion animal. Um, all right, bye, Eric. All right. So yeah, 209. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably, I'll probably call it for now. Um, but you know what? Like I can do this again. I would love to do this again. So, um, think about things we talked about here. Think about anything that comes up. I think I might, um, try to do this again, but present maybe some like headlines about life on earth. So like look through different research that has come out that day and maybe we can break it down or check it out. Um, yeah, I, I really, uh, love this. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Um, thank you for being a part of the nature league. Thank you for thinking and feeling about life on earth and all the wonderful, the good things, um, and sharing some time together, uh, during social distancing. Um, yeah, so questions definitely, um, put them on Twitter. I think, I guess you can probably put them within the comments here. I think this can be saved. I hope this gets to be saved for later. Um, 
you can do it on Facebook. Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, any of that would be lovely. Um, and I think I will uh, absolutely get to see you guys um, again sometime soon. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. And... Oh, okay. <laughs> that is Atlas. Atlas is a very cozy boy. <laughs> I told you I had all the cozies. Oh, cozy stretch. Good work, Atlas.